So among the many frontiers of human knowledge today, the one with the most potential to transform humans as a species may be neuroscience, the systematic and scientific study of the nervous system, including the brain. Modern neuroscience is a relatively young discipline with only 60 years of history. And yet, neuroscientists have already made great strides into unlocking how the brain cells called neurons contributes to our thoughts, our senses, and our movement. Advances in neurosciences are evidenced by the many highly publicized breakthroughs recently that involved interfacing brains with machines. We saw, for instance, a remarkable lady paralyzed by stroke and yet able to grab a cup of coffee out of her own volition using a robotic arm directly controlled by her own brain. Not too long ago, there is a company called Neuralink that announced the development of a chip with the size of a coin, managed to wirelessly record thousands of neurons at the same time. All of a sudden, it appears that we have arrived at a level of knowledge that will allow us to soon cure all the brain diseases, and perhaps we will soon live in a future world controlled and governed by the combined will of the people linked by AI as the Neuralink's founder, Elon Musk, envisioned. Now, I must say, such optimism imparted by these breakthroughs contrasts very sharply with how many neuroscientists, including myself, understand the state of their own discipline. Not only are we very far away from the promised rebirth of humans, we also have trouble understanding tiny little brains of the mice the red and even a fruit fly. In fact, we even struggle to understand the very simple nervous system of a tiny worm that is called C. elegans, with only 302 neurons to be precise. Over the last decade, many pharmaceutical companies have diverted their resources away from neuroscience research. So let's take a moment to reflect. Why is it so dauntingly difficult to understand the brain and to study the brain. Now, to appreciate this difficulty, let's take a look at how a neuron looks like. Neurons are specialized cells with processes that allow them to communicate with each other via electrical signals. Inputs are received via the dendrites, and electrical signals destined to other cells travel along the axon. When the signals arrive at the axon terminals, neurotransmitters are released into the space between neurons that is called the synapse. Now, the branching structures of the dendrites and axons of a single neuron looks complicated enough. But in reality, in any single block of neural tissue, there would be tens and thousands of neurons packed together densely with their processes all entangled with each other. Each neuron may receive inputs from a few to many different neurons while sending outputs to a few to also many neurons. The branching structures of the neurons are also immensely variable across different cells, with communications happening between neighboring neurons and also distant neurons. The human brain contains 86 billion of neurons with 100 trillion synapses in between them, all packed together within one-fifth of the volume of a soccer ball. So as you can see, the human brain is a giant neuronal circuit of mind-boggling complexity. It is a circuit composed of a wide variety of cell types and neurons along with its supporting cells. It is probably the most complex object that human beings know. Now, a fact not helping the experimental scientists is that the brain is soft and has the consistency of a tofu. Even with the most advanced technology now, it remains very difficult to record multiple cells simultaneously from the brain, and especially so for the cells in the middle of the tofu. 
So we have an object of this complexity then. What is the best way to approach the brain? Now, just as perhaps the first step towards understanding the machine is to dissect, dismantle it, and to understand how its components connect with each other. Perhaps to understand the brain, the first step is to see how the 86 billion neurons of the brain are wired up into our circuit diagram, what neuroscientists called a connectome. Now, after years of effort, what we do know now is the gross connection pattern between the major brain regions. And so we already have a very, very rough draft of the connectome. But already, as seen in this example from just the visual system of a monkey, it is already hopelessly complicated. In principle, it is possible to dissect the complete synapse level connectome of a human brain. In 2013, it was estimated that neuroscientists will need approximately 10 million years to dissect the connectome of one human brain. So even if we can speed up this process of dissection by 10,000 fold, we will still need 1,000 years to decode the connectome of just one human brain. This is how complicated it is. Now, but suppose that we miraculously arrived at a means to dissect the connectome within reasonable time. The big question is, how should this circuit diagram be used to understand our thoughts, perception, and movement? This turns out to be a surprisingly difficult question because there is not an obvious relationship between the structure of the neuronal circuit and behavior. American neuroscientist Eve Marder at Brandeis University has tried to tackle this question by studying very simple nervous systems, specifically the neuronal circuit that controls the gastrointestinal movement of the lobster. She found that in the simplest possible three neuron system, there are many different circuits with many different connection parameters that can give rise to the same behavior for the lobster gut, meaning that for any single behavior, there can be possibly an infinite number of circuits compatible with that behavior. At the same time, what she found is that any single lobster gut circuit is simultaneously and continuously under the control of many different hormones and neurotransmitters secreted from the lobster brain and the lobster's sensory nerves, so that with the influences from these hormones, this circuit may behave very differently. So what do these results mean? It simply means that even if you and I behave in identical ways, we may have a very different brains. And conversely, even if you and I have exactly the same brain with exactly the same neuronal circuits, we may be behaving very differently. Now, understandably, many neuroscientists are now starting to think that the connectome is fundamentally not useful for understanding how the brain works. This may all just be irrelevant details. And so this is the state of the art. Neuroscientists have not even reached a consensus on whether it is worth dissecting the human connectome. Thinking about the connectome is frustrating enough already. But our frustration is not over. Now, a hallmark of any nervous system is that it can learn and acquire memory. Even the tiny little worm C. elegans that I talked about was capable of learning and associating a food with a kind of smell. Learning and life simply go together. Now, but the big question here is, where in the connectome is any piece of memory stored? To understand this, recall that the junction between two neurons is called a synapse. It turns out that what we call the synaptic connection strength, or the extent to which signals in the input neuron can activate and excite the downstream target neuron, is not fixed but modifiable. As an example here, initially, neuron A as an input may excite the target neuron B with a one-to-one -one ratio. So one unit in A can produce one unit of activity in B. 
after the connection strength increases, it is possible that one unit in A can be translated into five units in the target B. This connection strength depends on the activities of the neurons. When neurons A and B tend to coactivate, the connection strength also tends to increase, so that neurons that fire together wire together. This phenomenon is known as synaptic plasticity. Because of plasticity, the connectivity of a neuronal network changes constantly in response to the network's inputs. Now, neuroscientists already have a consensus that learning and memory somehow has to do with synaptic plasticity. But the major big mystery here is what is the relationship between memory and which synapse to tune and by how much their connection strengths must be tuned. Now, movies of science fiction may have conditioned you to think that every piece of memory is encoded in a single neuron or a single synapse. But this cannot be further away from true. To remember even just a very simple impression, the strengths of many different synapses must be tuned intelligently. To appreciate this, let's take a look at this very simple neuronal network with just three layers of neurons. Our task here is to remember to associate the arbitrary inputs six and four with another pair of arbitrary outputs five and seven. In this cartoon here, the size of the exon terminal denotes the connection strength of the synapse. Initially, the synapses are not tuned appropriately so that we cannot reach our goal of five and seven. But after the synaptic strengths are appropriately tuned through the process of learning, we can reach our goal so that the output of the network, five and seven, matches our desired goal. So the pattern of synaptic strengths here is the actual memory trace of pairing six and four with five and seven. Now this sounds all easy enough, but the reality is that even such a simple network is embedded within a much larger neural network that is constantly bombarded by all kinds of inputs at unpredictable times, and those inputs must be paired with other outputs. So how then can the nervous system remember all these new pairings while making sure that our original 6, 4 to 5, 7 pairing is not lost but still recoverable? Plasticity is a good thing because it allows learning to happen. But there is a dark side to plasticity. Too much plasticity would compromise the previous memories and compromise the stability of the nervous system. If we compare learning by retuning the network of neurons as a kind of rebirth, this is a very special kind of rebirth because this is a kind of birth that allows pre-birth memory to be encoded in the network. How the nervous system does this, we really do not know at this point. So the brain is ultra complex, and the road ahead is very difficult. Right? So it might be helpful to have some goals. So what are the ultimate end game for modern neuroscience? Of course, along the way, we hope to arrive at some effective treatments for debilitating brain diseases. But an equally noble and important goal is to understand how our brain, the network of neurons, gives rise to consciousness, our awareness of ourselves as beings capable of moving, thinking, making decisions with a perhaps free will, and sensing with that ineffable quality of subjective experience. Most neuroscientists believe that consciousness arises from the material brain. Our cognitive and mental abilities is the end result of neuronal firings. There is no immaterial soul or little man sitting inside your brain telling how the neurons must behave. I have to say I do not have the absolute positive proof for this hypothesis, but evidence thus far in favor of it has been pretty compelling. For instance, there are patients with the two cerebral hemispheres disconnected for epilepsy control and they sometimes would behave as though there are two different minds residing in the same brain. Stimulation of specific brain areas 
may also elicit dreamlike hallucinations in these particular patients. Despite these observations, I must say also that there still seems to be an unbridgeable gap between firings of neurons and the actual experiences of ourselves, from the delicious taste of dim sum or cake to the tune of a Mozart opera to the fantastic sight of scenery and beautiful paintings. Finding the minimal neuronal mechanisms sufficient for any cognitive abilities remains the holy grail for many neuroscientists. So here we are, this is the state of the field. There are known unknowns concerning the relationship between neuronal circuits and behaviors, the nature of memory, and the neuronal correlates of consciousness. What then may we do to push these frontiers of knowledge? For sure, I would say we should invest in new technologies to simulate, stimulate, and record from the brains. My colleagues and myself have been using laser beams to activate new types of neurons, using carbon nanotube electrodes to record from the brain, and using novel machine learning algorithms to understand and derive insights from complex neural data. Perhaps we need to be very clear on what scientific questions these new technologies can address. We may also want to invest in our time to conjure up new theories of the brain that are experimentally falsifiable. But at the end, for something as elusive as consciousness, we may even need a new paradigm of thought that allows us to think about the brain in a radically different way. Before humans can be reborn with the necessary heightened level of self-knowledge about how the brain works, I would argue that neuroscience itself will need to undergo a rebirth. 